from Kona to Yanan, the political memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter 11, Red China and Yanan. When I attended the University of Hawaii in the late 1930s, I took part in a fundraising campaign to help students in China who were carrying universities on their shoulders in moving inland from the coastal area to the hinterland. They were escaping the Japanese invaders. I wrote a guest column for Kalio, the campus newspaper, and an article in a downtown daily appealing for funds. In the university's Oriental Institute Library, I read literature on the valiant struggle of Chinese students, and I was impressed by stories and illustrations of students studying in caves in a place known as Yan'an. I wrote about the cave classrooms in the Ka Leo column, not having the faintest idea that Yan'an was the capital of Red China and that I would be there about five years later as an Army G2 personnel member. Before I left Chongqing in October 1944 and flew north into Red China, my Chinese friends in the nationalist wartime capital asked me to write them in great detail about people and their living conditions in the communist liberated border regions. A large part of the liberated and guerrilla regions was located among the mountainous boundary area between provinces deep within Japanese-occupied territory, and this explains the term border region. In Chongqing I found that there was an amazing ignorance among people in nationalist territory about conditions in the Red Guerrilla areas. Chiang Kai-shek had slapped the blockade on to cut off communication between nationalist and communist-led areas. Chiang tried hard to keep information about Red China from reaching the outside world, but a group of dauntless correspondents forced him in the late spring of 1944 to let them visit the anti-Japanese border regions. By the time I flew into Yan'an, these correspondents, who represented conservative American and British newspapers, were coming out of Red China with stories that shocked and encouraged millions of people fighting the fascist and militarist power. The political climate was such, with the Allies becoming disgusted with Chiang, that the American press published these first-hand accounts of Red China. And in the light of stories told by the correspondents, the graft-ridden and corrupt nationalist government seemed all the more decadent, and challenged in the North by a new political force that allied itself not with the landlords, but with the peasants, and cooperated broadly with all classes of people in fighting the Japanese. The U.S. Army Observer Section in Yan'an to which I was assigned in October 1944 was probably the farthest U.S. military outpost in the Pacific War. It was established when Chiang Kai-shek finally gave into American pressure to allow U.S. observers into Chinese communist-led, liberated, and guerrilla territories. Chiang's army in China was lying down an anti-Japanese resistance, and it was General Joseph Stilwell's idea to bring the partisan forces into the orbit of Allied strategy under him and supply them with necessary light equipment to fight the enemy. When American observers first arrived in Yan'an, they were not sold on reports of communist China's popular democracy, or all-out anti-Japanese resistance. What they saw in Yan'an was a broad representation of the people and government, and machinery provided for even the illiterates to vote. Earthen jars were placed behind candidates or their pictures, and the voters cast their ballots by dropping beans or grain in them. I recall a long talk I had with an Office of Strategic Services captain shortly after I arrived in Yan'an. He spoke Chinese fluently and he was getting around quite a bit by himself, making personal observations among the people. He had been brought up in China, and he was one of several observers who spoke one or more dialects. He told me that Yan'an and the communist liberated and guerrilla bases behind the Japanese lines were different in many respects from the China he had known from childhood. He said that once the partisans liberated an area from the Japanese, they reduced land rent from 50 or 60 percent of the crop to 37 half percent, encouraged the peasants to increase production, established governments, organized schools for the young and old, put a stop to begging and prostitution by rehabilitating people, and wiped out usury. You can't write a straight report of what you observe here, the OSS captain told me. The social values of people here and life in general don't seem Chinese, and we haven't seen anything like this in China. You've got to lean backward to write reports with extreme objectivity. Otherwise, he said, my superiors in the Chongqing headquarters who accept graft, begging and prostitution as a part of life, especially in Asia, would discredit my observations as propaganda. Some Americans said Yan'an was window dressing and began going behind Japanese lines to see for themselves in guerrilla territory. Raymond Ludden, experienced foreign service officer of our State Department, went on such a trip. When he returned to Washington after an extended trip into guerrilla China, he reported the communist-led troops suffered from an acute shortage of supplies, but that they would put to good use any material they got. He added that the mass support the communist troops enjoyed everywhere he went was on too large a scale and too widespread to be merely window dressing. 
Fairly early one morning in the latter part of October 1944, I went down to the Chongqing airport. I had with me a United States Army travel order to Dixie. I also had a Chinese nationalist government passport. My destination was North China Guerrilla Territory. What was the GI Chinese relationship in guerrilla territory? I wondered. The air transport crew that flew to Yan'an said the people up north were active and vigorous. GIs at the Chongqing headquarters felt it was a break to get a Dixie assignment. The transport brought back fresh vegetables from Yan'an, and every GI who ate at the mess hall in Chongqing knew about Dixie, for we were told the greens and tomatoes grown in Yan'an could be eaten fresh. In the nationalist area, because of the human fertilizer used, we could not eat fresh vegetables. As I watched some Chinese workers loading a transport, I did not imagine the possibility that my assignment might be a long one. I had been given one month by the OWI director in China to survey the anti-Japanese psychological warfare of the Chinese communist-led forces and their prisoner re-education. I knew that I had extensive ground to cover and had prepared myself for the work as best I could. I had read leaflets and pamphlets issued by the converted Japanese POWs. I was told that their psychological warfare was so successful that Japanese soldiers were deserting their ranks to go over to the guerrilla forces. On that clear October morning as I waited for the flight, I never thought that I would one day ride a mule to a Chinese civil war front to investigate whether the nationalists had used American arms supplied for the anti-Japanese war. And many months later, I was as far away as Kalgan, beyond the Great Wall, in a city referred to as the Gateway to Inner Mongolia. I had with me large reproductions of American news photos, periodicals, books, movie projector and films. I was an American propagandist in the Chinese hinterland and rural areas. As I walked to the C-47 transport whose doors were ajar, taking in cargo from a truck which was backed squarely against the opening, I saw a slightly built Chinese worker trying to move an oil drum, his bare foot placed smack at its base as he heaved the top towards him. The drum did not yield. A tall, husky American corporal emerged from the door of the transport. He called two other Chinese workers who were moving a heavy box on the truck. The workers did not heed him. The corporal jumped down on the truck, grabbed the two by the back of their necks and brought them to the oil drum. The three Chinese tipped over the drum, timing their efforts with a mixture of chants and puffing sounds, and rolled it into the plane. The corporal noticed me. He said, Hi, Sarge. Hi, I answered. How you doing? Oh, so, so, he said. Soon our conversation warmed up and he complained about his job. These Slopies don't know whether they are coming or going, he explained to me. Slopey was G.I. jargon for slant-eyed Chinese, a white supremacist term like gook which G.I.s used to describe Koreans today. The corporal leaned heavily on his elbows against the truck side and looked down at me, sort of relaxed, to tell me a long story. You can't talk to these dumb bastards, he said. You've got to shove them around. Talk to them all day and you get nowheres. Do you speak Chinese? I asked him, no, English, but plain enough. I explained to them with motions and everything, and they nod their heads so I like, like this. And he gave me a demonstration, getting a big kick out of it. A Chinese standing by a duffel bag called, Hi, Joe, pointing to the duffel bag he asked, Chi Ka, yeah, roared the corporal as he turned towards the worker, motioning as though to say, throw the whole works into the plane. Everything, everything, he yelled, and it was plain that all the Chinese understood from his English was loud noise. The Chinese laughed, amused by the corporal's behavior. The corporal raised his foot, pretending he was going to boot the backside of the worker, which made the latter pick up the bag on his shoulder and run into the transport, laughing as he did so. There goes my bag, I said to the corporal. So you're going up north, Sarge. He turned around to talk to me. You know I'd like to see those Chinese Reds myself, not that it matters any to the war effort. I haven't met a Red yet. Like to know what they are like. He commented that pilots who flew the plane he was having loaded said the Reds up there were fighting the enemy, not like the Slopies under Shanker Jack. This was the GI nickname for Chiang Kai-shek. You know, the corporal continued, I'd take anything rather than this goddamn job. I didn't volunteer for the army to come all the way to China to be a coolie pusher. I volunteered, too, I said. That's one thing I learned in this army, never volunteer. When I enlisted, I signed up to fight the Japs. His voice hit a higher pitch. I hope to Christ we kill all them sneaking bastards and get this war over with. You can't trust them. You know, we got some of them Japs back home behind barbed wire. And he winked at me with a slight sidewise nod of his head. Lose anyone at Pearl Harbor? I asked. No, no kin of mine, but we lost a hell of a lot of good boys there. Then he paused and asked, Where you from, Sarge? Honolulu. Hawaiian Chinese, eh? He smiled as he looked down at me. No, Japanese American. For a few seconds the corporal was speechless. I almost told him that I had volunteered from behind barbed wire and watch towers. After the silence the corporal muttered, No kidding, Sarge. And his deflated voice trailed off. 
Then he added, with obvious embarrassment, there are some good Japs, hell of a swell guys. You know, and he smiled approvingly, guys like you. I didn't say a word. After an uncomfortable silence, he added, I didn't mean it bad, Sarge. It wasn't your kind I was talking about, but the other Japs. I understand, I said. We talked for a while longer and I told him that the term Japs, used to describe the Japanese people, was bad. The militarists and the big financiers were behind the aggressive war. The people didn't have any say. The use of the term slopey was bad, too. My explanation did not make much a dent on his mind, for his prejudice was deep-rooted. Then he said all of a sudden, dog on it, Sarge, in a serious manner, what if you guys get captured by them Japs? Wouldn't they give you the works, though? I walked toward the operations building and felt it was a great tragedy that a man like him, and so many other GIs participating in a war of liberation, were giving vent to their prejudices on innocent Chinese because they did not see the real purpose of their war activities. This corporal was unhappy in China, far from his family, friends, luxuries, and was unable to bear the boredom of life in Chungking. If the army had spent some time and effort to orient the GIs and officers with information about China and her people, the morale of servicemen would have been better and they would have developed more sympathetic understanding for the Chinese people. Just after we boarded the plane to fly northward, the Major General passed the word around to about three of us enlisted men that from now on we were to forget rank. We should not hesitate to talk to him freely and there was to be no wall created by rank. In their area we must live like them, he said. An enlisted man said, in other words, in Rome do as the Romans do. I guess that's it, the general said, meaning that that's how the Chinese partisans live. And we took off from Chungking. We flew over paddies and terraces of Shechuan province, which looked beautiful from the sky. The toiling peasants paid 50 to 60 percent of their yearly crop to landlords in payment for the use of the land. In Shechuan some landlords were collecting rents many years in advance. Some tenants revolted and Chiang Kai-shek used his American-trained air force to crush the protest. The farmlands gave way to rugged mountains and gorges. To the west was Tibet, with high mountains and natural barriers that made it almost inaccessible to the west. Then we were over Sion, the last nationalist bastion and frontier U.S. air base. Sion was also a stockcock that prevented people on the Chongqing side from crossing into communist areas. Hundreds of students who had tried to run the blockade into Red China had been arrested and locked up in Sion prisons. A Chinese youth I had met through Kaji Wataru, the anti-militarist Japanese writer and political refugee, described various tortures employed by the nationalists. He himself had spent a few years in a Kwaikau prison. He said prisoners' feet were boiled in pots equipped with ankle locks. He said faces were shoved into lime. Pigs' bristles were shoved into young women's nipples or other delicate parts. The students do not repent. The prisons manufacture communists because students turn more strongly against the Kuomintang. He said, I did not believe him entirely. Certainly there must be weaklings, I suggested, who were crushed when deprived of all human dignity by this barbarism and who become secret agents for the nationalists. He agreed, but he said the number was comparatively small. From Sion we flew northward and over the divide of Chongqing's China and Yan'an's China. Below us were Chang's blockhouses and garrisons for roughly 500,000 first-line troops, far away from the Japanese forces they should be fighting. They were sealing off the Shensi Kansu Ningxia border region. At last we were over Yan'an, accessible from the outside only to American personnel of the U.S. Army Observer Section. It was just as I had seen it in pictures at the University Library in Honolulu. Below us were endless stretches of barren, tawny Lois hills and valleys. Lois is cocoa-like dust, blown into North China from the Gobi Desert region for centuries, and in some areas it is more than 200 feet deep. Someone pointed out a long valley, running north to south, a few miles long. It forked as it came to a hill on which stood an old pagoda. A State Department official told me that the caves which pockmarked Pagoda Hill were headquarters of the Japanese Workers and Peasants School and the Japanese People's Emancipation League, JPEL. I would spend my time there, surveying Red China's POW treatment and prisoner re-education. Through the middle of the narrow valley flowed a silvery stream. The land looked old and tired, bare after the autumn harvest. It was terribly wrinkled by the ageless force of erosion. Everything looked ancient, peaceful and desolate. A few buildings were in sight. A fairly large western-style church nestled close against a hillside. It was the most impressive edifice, but more striking than anything were the caves, hundreds and hundreds of them pockmarking hillsides and cliffs, tier upon tier, up from the valley floor. We headed down a valley toward the landing strip. Ox carts, driven by white turban natives, toiled their lumbering way northward and southward along a dusty road along the airstrip. Camels led by nomads clad in furs also moved on the road. It seemed that everyone in Yan'an had come to greet us. Most of them were clad in blue or black cotton padded uniforms while others still wore thin cotton uniforms. Women were dressed like men. 
Deep caps hid their hair altogether. They wore no rouge or lipstick. One saw chapped cheeks and lips painted over with honey to prevent further aggravation. I was introduced to Colonel David Barrett, who in turn introduced me to Chinese officials. Among the many, one name sounded familiar, the name of General Chu Te. I saw a kindly face, broad and seemed half smiling at me. A warm, firm hand gripped mine. The man before me was like a peasant, extremely simple in appearance, clad in a faded, brown woolen tweed uniform. He was stocky and heavy. This was the legendary Chu Te, commander-in-chief of the communist-led forces. Two Nisei GIs, who like me were G2 personnel, were at the airfield. They told me that the communist-led forces had a tremendous amount of intelligence on the Japanese forces. Sergeant Shonamura as well as some American officers briefed me about conditions in Yan'an as soon as we arrived at the observer section. They were no beggars, prostitutes, or money changers, they said. A GI who had come in on the flight said he had to see it before he would believe it. After India and nationalist China were money changers, prostitutes, and beggars singled out GIs, he said he could not believe that in Asia such a Shangri-La existed, and this blockaded territory was economically the poorest area. So you won't believe us? Asked an officer. We didn't either, he said. He told us of an incident which was a very popular story in Yan'an. When the first contingent of American military personnel flew into Yan'an, the transport damaged its propeller when one of the wheels dropped into an old grave. The transport's crew stayed over, waiting for parts from Chungking. That night the Chinese 18th Group Army, which was the designation of communist-led forces, gave a dance to honor the Americans. A tech sergeant of the plane's crew made passes at a young lady, thinking what he did in Chungking was permissible in Yan'an. The next day, General Ye Qinyin, the chief of staff of the 18th Group Army, visited Colonel Barrett and indignantly protested the GI's conduct. He said that the Chinese would provide the Americans with clean entertainment and that the GI's should forget propaganda they might have heard about communist free love and that sort of thing. He said Yan'an was not chum king. General Ye explained that the women were equal with men in Yan'an, that prostitution did not exist and any incident of such was corrected as soon as it was discovered. Colonel Barrett called his group together. He scolded that the Americans were embarrassed and threatened that anyone violating the social customs and values of Yan'an would be sent back to Chungking as punishment. This was indeed punishment, for no American wanted to be sent back to depressing Chungking. The colonel suggested that the officers and men get rid of their supply of prophylactics immediately. One captain had an extremely large supply. When the Chinese heard about the large aggregate supply, they asked the Americans not to throw away the prophylactics. They wanted to use them in the hospitals for medical purposes. Save your old razor blades and cigarette cellophane covers for the Chinese. They are blockaded here and use these items also, an officer told us. Our experiences in Yan'an show that the American and Chinese people could live together in peace and friendship. In cooperating on the war effort, we learned about each other. We carried this relationship into social life in Yan'an. We had to change some of our social attitudes and behavior, and the Chinese did also. In Yan'an, we were asked not to address the teenage orderlies who looked after our personal needs as boy, a common expression used by foreigners in nationalist China, and as I recall, in the South by white people toward Negroes. We were asked to call these orderlies, many of whom were war orphans, men who looked after guests. As for female companionship, we were told that we would be provided with clean entertainment. There were no prostitutes or jeep girls as there were in Chumking. On Saturday nights Yana entertained the personnel of the U.S. Army Observer Group. We went across the Yen River to the 18th Group Army Headquarters to dance. We entered a barn-like auditorium. Almost every week General Chu Te rushed out to greet us. He led us to a corner where live charcoal gave off a warm glow from makeshift burners. He poured us tea, piled dried watermelon seeds on a table for us to chew. We cracked them with our teeth and spit out the shells. Chu Te huddled with his chief of staff, the exuberantly jolly General Ye Qinying, and the two went around to talk to women sitting along the walls. Soon we were swarmed over by them and they kept us dancing all evening. I watched legendary Chu Te dance the first night I went to Yang family's plane. His break with the feudal past, with all its lush living, for the life of a revolutionary, becoming one of the leaders of the Chinese communists, is a story in itself. An enlisted man who had read Agnes Smedley's book on Red China suddenly exploded, as he also watched Chu Te, how in hell did Agnes teach that guerrilla leader to dance. The general was chugging along in a very businesslike manner with his left arm folded in toward his shoulder. There was not a bit of variety in his step, but he was keeping good time with the music produced by a squeaking Chinese violin, a drum, cymbals, and a relic of a portable piano, whether it was jingle bells or a shensi folk song. He never seemed to stop dancing once he got started, and the ladies were flattered to dance with him. 
most of the women who danced with us were students at the english or russian language schools the english school in yanan was much the larger the students were eager to practice their english on us women students dragged us out on the floor while young male students waited to catch us for conversations between dances between them there was quite a competition and we were in great demand when the chinese new year came the peasants in the villages invited us to their places we attended several village banquets at our first village banquet a young woman who was apparently city bred acted as our hostess in her padded cotton blouse and slacks and blue cotton cap this young intellectual met us at the top of a hill and led us into a cave where the table had been set her conception of an average g i i soon learned was incredible she must have believed all the stories of american excesses circulating in china if she had read editorials and articles appearing in chungking newspapers on jeep girls she must not have credited us with high moral standards some chungking newspapers defended the jeep girls who the papers said should comfort the american allies who are far away from home others lamented the shameful moral corruption of young chinese womanhood promenading in public with foreign soldiers our hostess seemed to have set her mind on making us all drunk an interpreter who went along with us said that americans are great drinkers so she kept filling our cups with the potent tiger bone and pie car wine she drank tea and mild wine and expected us to bottoms up with her when we reneged she came to us grabbed our hands and forced burning liquor down our throats she laughed when we coughed and she slapped our backs to help the downward flow of liquor this young official who had been assigned to entertain us must have felt this was the proper role of a hostess entertaining rugged gis at a village banquet I was almost sure she had seen American movies showing bar scenes of the Barbary Coast or the Wild West. This seemed an extremely difficult role for her to play and beneath her acting there were definite signs of embarrassment. After this banquet we Americans conspired to make our Chinese host drunk at the next party. A drunk Chinese anywhere in China was a rare sight. So at the next village we individually toasted our host. There were about a dozen of us. Our host politely protested and wanted to have a joint toast each time. When we protested with equal politeness, he said he preferred weaker wine. As host, we said, he must consume tiger bone or pie car. After two hours, our host was still returning drink for drink with each of us. Some of us began to suspect that the Chinese liaison officers had tipped off this village, which had pitted their most powerful drinker against us to foil our scheme. When the banquet was over, our host reeled slightly. In deep suspense, we watched him stand up. He thanked us for coming to his village. Then he started home. We followed him with our eyes as he entered a compound. I saw him enter a cave. Some GIs swore they saw him sprawl on the floor as soon as he entered the doorway. Whatever it was, our host carried himself with dignity to the very last. I had an OWI 16mm movie projector with me in Yanan and part of my work was to show documentary American films. We invited students from the English school, from the Japanese workers and peasants school where POWs were being re-educated, from the Korean Independence League and various other organizations. Films on the Tennessee Valley Authority, mechanized farming and industrial production in the U.S. were all popular. Farmer Henry Brown, a film on a successful Negro planter, impressed peasants and soldiers. There were students who had reservations about this picture. This is not all true, is it? One of them asked me. Yes, it is, I told him. I don't believe you, he said, shaking his head. There are Negro farmers who are doing quite well, but they are so few. Most of them are poor, worse than our poor peasants. We have poor sharecroppers, surely. Why don't you show pictures about them? He thought we should show the good and the bad, not only good, so that the film would point to improvement. Others would join in the discussion and tell me of rural life in China, the superstitions of the peasants and how they were being combated, and of the model farms and labor heroes. And in talking to them I learned many things which I would never have been able to observe during my short stay in China and because of my limited background knowledge of the vast country. The 18th Group Army photo section took our films and projectors into the countryside to show movies to peasants who probably never had seen any in their lives. The photo section had an old gasoline generator. I loaded the generator on an ox cart and saddled the projector and amplifier on a mule and in this fashion toured the villages. The photo section also cooperated in holding exhibitions of enlarged OWI photographs on the Pacific and European War and about the various facets of life in the United States. To the guerrilla war fronts we sent U.S. periodicals, photographs and film strips which could be shown by a small projector drawing power from a hand-operated generator used in radio transmission. I interviewed American observers who went into various guerrilla bases and downed pilots who were brought out by the Chinese from behind Japanese lines. 
They reported on how our material on hygiene, medical research, industrial production, and numerous other subjects was shown to troops, government workers, and civilians. Months later in Sign, I met one of these rescued pilots. We were then helping Chiang Kai-shek in the Civil War and the pilot said he did not want to fly. He told me of his experiences in the Chinese villages when for many months his northern Chinese rescuers helped him dodge the Japanese and finally brought him out to Yan'an. If we helped the Chinese peasants to get a better deal there would be no war, there would be peace, he said. And his statement holds true today for Indochina and other areas where the people want change, a better life with human decency and respect.